Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Jean, for inviting me. Thank you, Christina. You've been a uh, wonderful loss. Thank you for the students who came and um, um, yeah, stayed with me for three days. So we had a, a very great discussion every day. So um, I have prepared something for you to follow me, if you can't follow me otherwise. <laughs> um, I know things are challenging, and this is a challenging topic just to think with machines or about machines is, um, is a challenge in itself, although we use machines all the time. So my talk is really to try and rethink of cybernetics, which is a science of communication and information which was born during the, um, the 1940s. It suggests that since the 1940s, uh, philosophy or the teleological project of Western metaphysics has been reconfigured by information technologies. Our age, as Giorgio Agamben, an Italian philosopher, argues, has radicalized what uh, Guy Debord called the society of the spectacle, because the mediatic regime of contemporary capitalism has tapped into the very communica communicativity and linguistic being of humans. According to Agamben, what human beings communicate to one another is pure communicability, that is language, and politics precisely arises as the communicative emptiness in which the human emerges as such. In particular, in this age of communicability, we shall be concerned with what is the matter of thought itself, or what is the power of thought. This power, for Agamben, means to be into language itself as pure mediality, being into a mean as irreducible condition of human beings. But this immersion into mediality also reveals that with cybernetics, the very automation of communicability, the automation of language, also um, thought and also thought has been um, really challenging what for Western metaphysics is philosophy. From the automated networks of decision making in governance and security, to the uh, unsupervised routine of intelligent logistics and the technological reinvention of gender, race and class, and ulti ultimately of the category of the human, cybernetics has in embodied the mediality of communication, the mediality of language, in terms of information, information retrieval, information storage, information transmission. Here, cybernetics shall be not simply seen as a science of communication and control in prediction or, governing, uh, or governance of population, but as part of a more general historical reconfiguration of metaphysics on behalf of techniques, i.e. on behalf of machines, where instrumentality has, had, has led to a profound transformation of what we take the social to be, um, and also what we take the very effort of thinking. In short, I want to suggest that with cybernetics, technicity, instrumentality, machines, has finally shifted away from a role of just demonstrating an idea, and has acquired a quality um, in which it, it can articulate in a new way uh, the relation between means, i.e. instruments, and ends, i.e. ideas for which instruments need to work. Uh, cybernetics has forced, I would argue, Western metaphysics to abandon its teleological project of reasoning and ultimately has brought thought to, to confront the consequences of thinking through and with machines. Martin Heidegger, in 1969, wrote this um, little essay called The End of Philosophy and the Task of Thinking. For Heidegger, philosophy and the teleology of Western metaphysics has evolved into scientific knowledge and technology. I science and technology during the Second World War took over and replaced humanities and philosophy for him. Um, and this kind of mentality has to do with the effectiveness of results and the ultimate replacement of theoretical reasoning with the su supposition of categories. 
But I want to question Heidegger's critique of cybernetics, which for him demarcates the point of completion or the ultimate realization of a Western teleological thinking when communication science replaced the so-called rule of reason with instrumentality or thinking. Since World War II, cybernetics and computation have imparted a new image of reasoning related not just to the mechanical behavior of clocks, but to the responsive feedback and the prediction activities of intelligent machines. We're all used to the responsive feedback of our little uh, computational machines that we use today, namely the mobile phone and social media. With cybernetics, reasoning was replaced by a dynamic form of calculation, embedding humans and machines in endless feedback loops bound to information signals, noise, recording and transmission of data. Here learning became central to the task of thinking, which replaced truth, i.e. reasoning based on judgment by discernment with a procedural process uh, of understanding by means of testing, trial and error. The scientific reformatting of philosophy did not grant reason a universal schema of rules from which one could deduce truth. Instead, the alignment project of scientific emancipation had unintentionally entrapped the very, its very principle, i.e. reason, within the science of organization and governance of labor, the arts, and all aspects of social life. With cybernetics, Western metaphysics had renounced the security of concept deducing truths and entered an automated world of formula, regulatory cause, and probability calculation. In other words, as science became the instrumental um, function of reason that would purge philosophy from myth, cybernetics also stripped metaphysics from uh, some kind of theoretical idealism, showing that rules bounded thinking follow instead an inductive mode of trial and error, a way of discovering unknowns rather than confining thinking to what is already known. With cybernetics, reasoning becomes instantiated in automated learning, self-regulation of behavior that adapts to the environment and modify its initial premises. So for Heidegger, cybernetic announced the end of Western metaphysics, the reduction of metaphysics, i.e. of philosophy, to instrumentality. It reconfigured the nature of governance through some kind of efficient machines based on algorithmic communication. But soon after the 1940s and during the Cold, Wo Cold War, the cybernetic infrastructure of governance was still functioning as some kind of technological unconscious of modernity. Because what technolog technology was doing was actually acting as a symptom of failure, of the failure of the modern project of rationalization, granting some kind of an unlimited exploitation of the world with the Industrial Revolution. Techniques then were still embodying this kind of unconscious of philosophy, despite eliciting a new aesthetic and a new political vision of a dehumanized culture. By acting as the mediatic unconscious of this kind of informational infrastructure of thinking since World War II, cybernetics therefore has, was the system for governance or has become since then the system of governance of the social, relying on um, truth carried out by machines. So for Heidegger, the efficiency of information was also the determination of man as an acting social being for it is the theory of the steering of the possible planning and arrangement of human labor. Cybernetics for him transforms language in an exchange of news. Similarly, the arts become regulated and regulating instruments of information. With the migration of cybernetics into the area of computation and artificial intelligence, logos or reason became enmeshed with the ratio or calculus. As historians of science Lorraine Dawson explains, after World War II, 
the replacement of the faculty of judgment with algorithmic rules turned reason into rationality, the fitting of means to ends, uh, based on statistical prediction and correction of human irrational behavior. But this argument was already confuted in the 1980s when post-critical understanding of cybernetics argued that, that, that um, the techno-rational governance had already triggered the crisis of Western reasoning because the mediality of thought had finally exposed the political dimension or the political tension between theory and practice and thus challenged the colonial, the patriarchal project that imparted its truth on the instruments, the bodies, the population, the races and genders that it used to obtain its pre-ordered results. By exposing the tension between means and ends, patterns and randomness, rules and contingencies, truths and uncertainties, what cybernetics did, therefore, is that it became the opportunity to develop a new critical thinking of the human subject. Um, uh, a critique of its organic wholeness and its cognitive representation of the world, therefore challenging the representational perspective of the material, the affective, and the bodily consistency of the real. For instance, Donna Haraway in the, in the 1980s wrote the, the, um, the Cyber Manifesto in which she argues that uh, uh, the cyber defined defied and challenged the modern rational subject, whose mission against myth, superstition, and obscuratism had led to the violence of colonialism, patriarchy, and capitalism. But the consequences of this um, modern rational subject project was that um, its techno-progressive vision, vision instead had led to a realization that technicity had come to coincide with the non-pure and contaminated cultures claiming for the intersectionality of gender, race, and class, and also of animal, human, and machine. Importantly, the domination of rational instrumentality was here reversed. The instrument did not follow Asimov's law, and instead of simply rebelling against the master, it pushed to its extreme consequences the already debilitating master rule of reason, um, as this entered the recursive patterns of information. Here, technicity can no longer remain unconscious and invisible. Finally, technicity enters the realm of a no longer human consciousness. In other words, techniques had itself become instrumental to consciousness, but not simply because, as Adegar had claimed, um, it came to replace Western metaphysics. Instead, what I would like to suggest and what I've been trying to work on is the fact that the idea that if instrumentality has become con central to consciousness, it is because it offers a possibility of working through the limits of the metaphysical project of reason that is, of exposing the consequences of, of instrumentality that corresponded to the social political claim for the origination of another mode of reasoning, uh, moving from within and throughout the meaning of instrumentality. This vision of instrumentality, however, is not simply an invitation to approach technicity or machines as a way of crafting the world away from logical machines, or to argue for some kind of nature that we have to go back to and that um, could re re reformat or re help us to rethink this domination of information on the planet. Instead, my attempt is to rethink critically and constructively instrumentality as the means by which Western metaphysics had to work through uh, what he had kept most invisible from itself, i.e. the limits of thinking, insofar as the very instrument upon which um, the transmission of truth was based, rather revealed a general condition of indeterminacy, of fallibility, irrational thinking. In short, this is an effort to theorize the artificial thinking of machine as the origination of an alien thinking, of an alien reasoning, which does not just correspond 
to the de debilitated subject of Western patriarchal and white, su and white subjectivity. Instead, what remains crucial to unpack is the possibility of alternative modes of thinking tri triggered by this emergence of instrumentality where um, in uncertainty plays instead technique beyond the dominant image of cybernetic control. So my attempt here is to reverse the critique of technology and rethink technology as the, or, 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 through cybernetics as a way to bring forward another mode of reasoning, a mode of reasoning that was born uh, through historically during the 40s and after during the Cold War as a mode of um, um, challenging the modern project of rationality through which colonialism, patriarchy, uh, uh, capitalism had uh, activated their teleological project. So I am going to refer to two models of critique of cybernetic computation that, are, um, that uh, have been kind of arguing um, um, about you know, how can we rethink technology away from power or how do we think of technology, this mode of computational infrastructure that we have today in terms of power. So, um, for instance, I'm going, to look at, I'm going to look at what Brian Massumi calls onto power and what Benjamin Bratton calls computational sovereignty. Because both this model, both of this critique, uh, seem to ground the end of reason into some kind of metaphysical machi machinism without soul. A kind of understanding of technology where the instrument looks back at us indifferently. Instead, mine is some kind of um, an attempt, or some kind of what we could call a philo fictional attempt to argue for the historical origination of an automated reasoning in terms of a denaturalized metaphysics thus involving a logic and a knowing stemming from the cybernetic inquiry into thinking and also the cybernetic inquiry into becoming the instrument of thought. Um, I turn to some, a pragmatist understanding of instrumentality, especially in particular John Dewey, to suggest that information is not simply a means of communication. Instead, the instrumental or practical use of information is this? Um, sorry, the uh, practical use of information also involves an inferential mode of reasoning involving the generation of meaning and not just the demonstration of truth. Um, insofar as this automated system that we are dealing today, especially, especially modes of things such as machine thinking, you know why it's not moving, um, actually are not just matching data, but they are learning from data. Um, whilst autom autonomous learning has always been central to both cybernetics and computational envisioning of intelligent behavior, um, post-1980s expert uh, uh, and knowledge system, uh, intelligent agents, machine and deep learning intelligent automata shall rather be considered as part of a third order cybernetics. Uh, so my question um, is whether we can af offer an alternative articulation of artificial reasoning and thinking of the instrument and instrumentality not just as a mean to an end, but as something that can engender itself a logic. The larger implication of this metaphysics requires a further analysis about the political implication for the no post-1980s radical claim about the ontological alliance between gender, race, and machine. In short, my question is, um, what kind of instrumental reasoning can be used against and away from the totalizing image of cybernetics as the triumph of mediality or the collapse of logical thinking, reasoning, and metaphysics? So, um, Masumi's analysis of neoliberal and neoconservative governance discusses control in terms of what is called second order cybernetics. And echoing Michel Foucault, argues for the becoming environmental or cybernetic power. What does it mean? That governance today coincides with a continuous regulation of effects, um, the automation of responsive behavior 
acting as checkpoints of verification beyond the appeal to pre-establish causes. At the core of this new form of automation is the tension between information patterns, noise and randomness, which, following Bassumi, define what he calls onto power, i.e. the preempting of uncertainty. Power is haunted by unknowns or ontological liminal thresholds between its interactive functions and the virtual field of its action. The modus operandi of cybernetic decentralized interactive um, and parallel procedures overlaps with the, the temporal and affective field of variations of conduct. For Masumi, um, cybernetic control shows that the rational system of prediction has become attuned to the visceral recording of continuous effects, replacing rationality with affectivity. Masumi calls this activity of prediction preemptive strike. Environmental governance indeed replaces statistical classification by directly monitoring affective responses and learning from data in order to measure unknowns. Cybernetic control here espouses the metaphysics of indeterminate causality, coinciding with the snowballing effects with the processual behavior of, na of nature. Here, causality coincides with the condition of the accident, or indeterminate indeterminacy. This is why he says the power today works as an environmental form of preemption, not a, la a rational logic aiming at enframing the truth on the future, but some kind of affective piercing of the future through the cybernetic vision of the present. Instead of a cognitive rational mapping, cybernetics control depends upon the affective responsive to, a, to potential threats and thus subsume cognitive reasoning not only to aff affective procedure but also to a zone of indistinction between probability and potentiality. From this standpoint, power is not an ideology but is continuously produced and presupposed, induced and deduced, active and passive, and operates in this zone of logical indistinction between being and control. But this view of cybernetic control seems to preclude a discussion about a less clear tendency in computation, i.e. the fact that with the shift from um, reason to procedural reasoning that already happened during the Second World War and, and the Cold War, what also this transformation allowed was ju not just a kind of denigration of reasoning, uh, a winding down of reasoning, but actually the emergence of a new mode of thinking through procedures. Um, this means that, um, for instance, if we go and look at um, what Benjamin Bratton calls the planetary computation, it shows instead that uh, what, we are, um, what, what governance operates today, uh, the way it operates today, is through a cybernetic megastructure that has engendered its own perceptual and conceptual mode of visions. It's not just us who look at machines, it's also machines that look at us. So this kind of historical transformation uh, of cybernetics um, during um, the Second World War and then Cold War during the 80s has led to a kind of automation of thinking by and through machine. Um, but this thinking is not just about procedures, the tasks that are added one against the other to give us results. It's also the capacity of machine to think and to pre uh, preempt or predict uncertainty or unknowns, or to uh, impose a certain mode of conduct, or some kind of envision or inscribe a certain mode of conduct. Um, and this is what, uh, for instance, Benjamin Bratton calls uh, in order of, in his kind of visualization of how this kind of infrastructure of this automated system work. You know, if you look at logistics, branding, uh, of course, the internet, security, um, social networks, there is some kind of, intelligence operating within and beneath our, the, the surface. 
So there is this kind of disconnection between what we think we are operating and what we think the way we are using machine to achieve a task, and instead the way uh, algorithmic uh, intelligence is using data to achieve other tasks that are not necessarily transparent to us. Actually, it's the opposite. Um, so in order to describe this kind of uh, 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 governance, um, uh, cybernetic governance, uh, Bratton uh, uses this, 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 uh, this, this form or this concept of the stack. Um, in order to describe the geopolitical and new geopolitical orders, where um, which is both uh, indifferent to the aesthetic and logical se sensibility of the human, the stack imparts its own metaphysical principle of social governance that are mainly subjected to the internal contingency of this mega structure of cybernetic control. Because obviously, what is it has been become uh, important uh, um, is that from uh, the 18 onwards is that actually machine, the idea of machine efficiency has been completely confuted by the idea that actually machines break down, that mach there is an indeterminacy in the way machine and logic in machine operates. So um, this means that there is contingency, the machines are open to be um, affected by unknown causes. Um, so the idea that uh, the, the Second World War idea that machine could actually replace reason or the kind of human error with some kind of mechanism that could purge um, function from any kind of error, or from any kind of mistake, has completely been turned uh, over uh, in, after the 80s where instead there's been a recognition that the limit of computational logic and the limit of, of, uh, of cybernetic functioning is exactly uh, fallibility, lack of completeness of data, and what is also being called the incomputable. So there is this kind of interesting um, transformation that helps us also to think that if we were to say, well, um, machine can, um, uh, uh, the critique to technology needs to be based on some kind of recuperation of social, uh, cultural, um, um, you know, social cultural critique that whereby machine could never be able are just some kind of cold rational system. Um, this kind of critique doesn't hold anymore because machines are not just cold rational system because machine. In the, the kind of uh, development in artificial intelligence and in cybernetics has instead led us to think that machines can also think the unthinkable, i.e. that they are able to uh, work through breakdown, through fallibility and through contingency, which is something that was not what was be uh, believed when they were actually invented um, uh, during the 50s, 60s, and 70s. So when they were, were, were actually, there, is this other, there was this other mentality of the efficiency of the machine. So what Benjamin Bratton is actually also pointing out is that there are contingency within this mega structural machine that we are, um, that we are embedded in today. Um, he, he talks about the stack as the state, and it says that the stack is a machine, and the machine is the state, and it's not just representative of power, but it's generative of power. It's generative of perception, cognition, and action that are mediated by computational logic, by cybernetic feedback of communication and interaction. Accidents and not logical reasoning are the ontological condition of this form of governance. Local computation are here contingently reassembled in an evolving mega machine whose sources are human discourses, human bodies, affectivities, emotions and behavior. And basically what he's saying that is that as we deliver our data to data system whenever we are purchasing a book or we are uh, buying a ticket to go to the theater or we are passing border controls, what we are doing is that um, uh, is provide data to this evolving mega machine whose sources exactly are human discourses, 
the way we, we talk, we communicate through machines, uh, human bodies, you know, the data about um, uh, you know, uh, uh, your, uh, about your health, for instance, or, or affectivities, the way we empathize or not with other people, emotions and behavior, uh, as well as information on molecular, chemical, physical, cultural, social, and personal scales. So um, if second order cybernetic was concerned with this kind of system of affective control, the stack is closer to a third order cybernetics because its metaphysics is not without a cause. Um, no longer some kind of a rippling effect that stops the machine from total control, but the conscious realization or the interiorization of the contingency of mediality. I, to communicate, even in, terms, even in the form of automation, is a contingent, aff contingent affair. Um, you always are dealing with um, the possibility of error uh, and also you're dealing with unknown data. So the, the idea that this mega machine is in control, is a totalizing mega machine, is not, does not correspond to reality because the mega machine, on the contrary, functions precisely because it's able to deal with uncertainty, non-predictable behavior and, and um, uh, unknown. So in a way, indeterminacy or uncertainty is at the base of this machine. Uh, so when we think about automation, we, we, we are used to think about the efficiency of a mean that gives us, uh, that carries out, allows us to carry out a task. Um, for instance, here, great, great, great example. All of 2001 Space Odyssey is a, a computational machine that is, is, is not used to error, and when sees error, i.e. human, that is the human, uh, what it, it, it stops working and or the task is to eliminate the error. The kind of machine we're talking about today, i.e. machine learning, deep learning, uh, Google uh, Dream, what, all the machines that are post, uh, post 80s and post 90s uh, are really machines that instead do work through error. So error or is no longer a limit to computational and cybernetic thinking. And that's uh, also what Benjamin Bratton is trying to describe and argue that this is therefore a new mode of dealing with uh, governance and with power that has to account for this kind of um, uh, fragility, vulnerability, accident determined decision making machines. So, uh, like the computational looping, branching, and processing of the algorithm values entered into an interspace, the stack entails sovereign decisions based not on fixed protocols, uh, but on the accidental interaction between layers accumulating into more comprehensive structure. The stack is already crafting politics, geography, and territory into the image of an accidental decision machine. I think this is also something that we can grasp quite intuitively if we think about whenever we want to try to get something done and we are, the reply that we get is the computer says no. You know, so there's this kind of, there is an accident, the computer is down, the system is down. And this is also something that has justified, um, you know, a lot of uh, amounts of uh, money that has disappeared or, or reappears all of a sudden when, um, uh, for instance, uh, there are transactions with high frequency trading. Um, there is this kind of vulnerability uh, and contingency of the machine that allows precisely for a new governance to operate. To operate by error rather than to operate by excluding error. Um, and, and that's an interesting uh, shift uh, that Benjamin talks about in terms of how not only automation of labor, but it's precisely the automation of perception and cognition um, a, a, that uh, is able to articulate this kind of multi-layer infrastructure of software protocol where network technologies operate within a modular and interdependent order, exposing the internal contingencies of cybernetic metaphysics, fragmenting this totalizing image of procedural efficacy into thousands of computational 
um, machine at all, or computational procedures at all scales. It's also the idea that there is no one centralized computational power. It's precisely based on many, many layers of autonomous computational processing of information, of all the data that can be gathered by, um, by system of governance or institutions or health services or insurance or banks, um, which most of the time we deliver in a very spontaneous way. Um, to put it crudely, whilst the idea of the onto power that Masumi describes explains cybernetic governance as some kind of continuous modulation of affects, preempting the future, stopping the future from happening, the stack instead envisioned the fact that cybernetic machine thinking is made of contingency. And that's where complexity lies. These views does offer us a very important contribution, at least for my research, and hope I can communicate that to you, to reframe instrumental reasoning away from this kind of Adegarian conviction that cybernetic fulfills the dream of Western metaphysics. Um, but my attempt is rather to re-envision cybernetic metaphysics, um, not just some, as some kind of accidental or some kind of contingency-led system, because what I'm interested in is to recuperate a mode of reasoning or to enlarge the category of reasoning to non-human uh, modes of uh, um, pro processing information. Uh, so mine is a kind of uh, critique of human sapiens, but also rethinking of what human sapiens or human reasoning, how to rethink it, by uh, starting with um, looking at how the means, the instrument, has indeed developed a mode of reasoning through cybernetics and computation, because what has happened with cybernetic computation is that there has been this shift from reason as some kind of truth to reasoning as learning. So there is a, another mode um, of uh, um, rethinking uh, not only uh, uh, human uh, uh, reasoning, but also human subjectivity, and therefore human politics, as being open to um, the instrument that has been used by, um, uh, by Western metaphysics and has rebelled against Western metaphysics and has produced a new form of reasoning, which seems to me quite urgent, we um, engage with and try to unpack uh, rather than uh, assume that actually is a problem of science or is a problem of governance. This is also a problem from art, for humanities, uh, and for politics. So um, my attempt is to situate the origination of instrumental logic within the scientific investigation of the relation between information patterns and randomness. Here, algorithmic functions learn to transcend themselves, not in an accidental fas fashion, so not beyond reason, because to admit that this mega machine operates beyond reason is to admit uh, that uh, it will be, is, is, is to admit a political defeat as to how instead that the task of a critical thinking of machine or technology should be instead rather to uh, engage or to unpack or to formulate uh, modes of logic that are inclusive of what we don't understand, uh, rather, than, uh, being, um, uh, rather than being kind of uh, arguing for a limit uh, of reasoning uh, in machines. Uh, so um, whilst this mode remains an alien or denaturalized form of reasoning and is uh, neither completely idealistic nor empirical, um, nonetheless, it shall, it shall not be inaccessible to the arts and the humanities, ontological and epistemological inquiries into the active thinking of machines. Instead, if the structure of governance continues to grow in this seamless accidental, accidental fashion, um, perhaps critical efforts uh, shall be able to offer accounts of, no, of modes of reasoning that are alien to us, so, it, so as to address assumption about 
what instrumentality and what this kind of mediatic infrastructure of sociality in which we are all embedded today is and can do. One way to do so may involve a critical approach to algorithmic information theory because for me algorithmic information theory is what explains how uh, cybernetics has stopped being just a mode of statistical calculation but has become also a mode of learning and thinking the incalculable. So since the 1940s there's been experiment in cybernetics and computation that have concerned not just uh, that have concerned the development of an inferential reasoning with machines involving learning or the use of unknown information. One is to go back to Alan Turing's discovery of what he called the incomputable and Godel claims about incompleteness in formal thinking to suggest that the automation of reason was a way to experiment with the medium of thought and extend logic and statistics beyond universal truth and probability. Uh, only in the 1980s that uh, uh, post-Turing and post-second order cybernetic focus on this relation between information and randomness to experiment with the function of autonomous learning. So an autonomous elaboration of information beyond premises which is now central to deep learning artificial intelligence and their neural net infrastructure. This is a predictive a computational evolving machine and what is important is that uh, the, after the 80s uh, is that machine uh, or the automation of reasoning or the automation of learning really became um, merged with what is called the kind of introduction of time into thinking. That's why learning becomes something that is important because it's about how you move from, uh, uh, from cause to effect or from premises to result. And what happens in the middle is an elaboration of data. But the elaboration of data can only occur in time or through time. In fact, one of the most important inventions or kind of uh, development of uh, what already von Neumann elaborated in uh, uh, the 1950s is cellular automata. Cellular automata are just algorithms, sets of procedures that are uh, programmed to evolve in time. But this evolution in time is not just a linear evolution. This kind of cellular automata can evolve in, also in, in, in a circular, non-linear, retroactive time. So there's always a way that they can map many modes of behavior or many modes of, uh, um, of, of, of kind of patterning of data simultaneously at a long distance um, and parallelly and so on. So time is what enters artificial intelligence, uh, not just some kind of uh, representation of the mind through symbols but kind of uh, the, the very uh, capacity of change from premises to result, from uh, input to output. And what becomes uh, important for information theory and uh, computation is that prediction, therefore, is no longer done on probability, i.e. on what was already known, or what you input into the system. Actually, it's the opposite. You start from somewhere to get somewhere else completely that you had not envisioned, i.e. the result cannot be contained in the premise, but needs to be, but, but the data contained in the premise need to elaborate in time according to certain uh, variables so to arrive to a result that you had not anticipated. And obviously this is, in art, has been you know, interestingly used to experiment with uh, some production uh, that lasts a thousand years, for instance. You know, where you, you know, the, the, the sound evolves and the, this, there is this generative algorithm that continues to evolve uh, uh, in time. Or, uh, you know, in architecture where you have um, uh, intelligent system or intelligent floor, intelligent walls that again are able to adapt to the input from the outside. But they are not just pre-programmed to do something specific. They can also uh, um, deal with what in, uh, in information theory is called randomness. What is randomness? Randomness is not something arbitrary. 
that's something that uh, um, can be chosen between two, two, uh, two sets of information. But randomness is a volume of information that cannot be compressed into a single formula, into a number, or into some kind of thing, into a theory. So it's, it's precisely the idea that incompleteness, i.e. randomness, is at the core of, uh, of information. So when, for instance, when we talk about big data or uh, data mining processes, what we are talking about is machines that are, are trying to reduce read or make a pattern out of data because the quantity of data is infinite insofar as also the quantity of uh, any quantities the quantity of numbers is infinite the quantity of realities is infinite so there is this kind of realization in the 80s already with Gregory Chaitin who is an al algorithmic information theorist who said actually what what Turing discovered in the 40s, uh, in the 40s I, the idea of the incomputable, like you don't know when a program will stop, or you don't know whether results will ever match premises. You cannot completely have a formula that can uh, calculate everything, uh, and he called the incomputable. He says, actually, this is at the very core of computational system today, i.e., uh, computational. Uh, Computational processes are never ended, uh, and, and what does this mean? It means that therefore, it means that uh, indeterminacy or unknown or incomputable or massive value of, of volume of data are precisely the condition for calculation, rather than being the opposite of calculation. So, without ma infinite masses of data, you cannot calculate, you cannot predict, and even if you predict. Even prediction can always uh, only approximate a result, but you can never know for sure. And this is why we have a lot of, uh, um, you know, this is why we have this kind of fallibility into the, ma into the machine. And you have this kind of things that are neural networks that are, you know, able to map different kinds of, uh, um, uh, of, of sites where information becomes more relevant or, or, or where data can be tracked or can be organized so that you have some kind of result. But nonetheless, there is no complete computational system. But that doesn't mean, to my mind, that this computational system is therefore fallible, breakable, or illogic. Instead, what I, my, my question is that we we'd rather um, look into or extend our notion of logic and reasoning and, uh, and, and find out or, or, or kind of re-theorize or challenge, or uh, this is a big challenge, or challenge uh, um, uh, our assumption of what logic, ideas, concepts and meanings are and, um, and rethink what or, uh, or analyze and uh, investigate or inquire into this logic of the instrument. Because this kind of instrument have a logic, uh, rather than being just something that operate magically or they break down accidentally, and because they operate through uncertainty, therefore they are themselves uncertain, uncertain or irrational. I don't think this is the case, and this is something that um, uh, um, critically what must be addressed. So, um, from this standpoint, if cybernetic does not just mark the completion of Western metaphysics, but the origination of an alien metaphysics or a technologic carried out by machines, it is because the historical transformation of the rule of reason into this kind of procedural reasoning involves the ingression of incomputables or uncertainties into modes of prediction and programming conducts. Um, incomputables or randomness ra does demarcate the transcendental tendency within the medium to think beyond what it does. So it's not what it, what it does does not correspond to what it thinks because the system is so completely. This is a kind of surgical, uh, the, the way that uh, the use of machine learning in surgery, in brain tumor surgery actually. So. Um, 
so here instrumental reasoning becomes also a mode of knowing how. It's developing another mode of knowing, uh, enacting truth, enacting a certain kind of behavior and a certain kind of uh, um, a certain kind of philosophy, a mode of, of knowing that is not contained within you know, the idea of human sapiens or the, amnia, or the idea of rational thinking. So in order to address the computational strata of controlled societies today, it may no longer be sufficient to rely on this uh, kind of given idea of reasoning or even computation. The effort of in inventing propositions about what the logical machine can become within our computational infrastructure requires, therefore, a rehabilitation of instrumental reasoning. Um, my point is that if artificial thinking has acted as a denaturalized consequence of reasoning, i.e. de-essentializing universal truth, it can also become a space for reinventing human politics, for reinventing human subjectivity through the alien reasoning of machines. One possible way to question the exceptionalism of human uh, sapiens without falling back into an anti-logical metaphysics could be precisely to start from um, what uh, um, uh, John Dewey, pragmatist John Dewey, called uh, experimental logic. For Ju John Dewey, instrumentality should be concerned with the consequential elaboration of thinking from doing. So this is also a plea to say that when we look at machine uh, learning or when we look at automated system or this intelligent automated system, what they are thinking does not correspond to what, does not correspond to what they are doing. So it's not that they are unconscious or non-cognitive or they are able, they are just carrying out tasks. Uh, the question instead is that instrumentality itself or the, the means, the action, the function, the carrying out task of a, of a mean already implies an elaboration of thinking from doing. Instrumentality, therefore, is not just a real, is not just what realizes an idea, but is a practical elaboration of truth. For Dewey, thinking is itself an intelligent medium, and similarly, machines are intelligent techniques. Instrumentality, therefore, poses no ontological distinction between humans and machines. And yet, one has to argue that this commonality does not imply that the human and machine are of the same kind, and the way they reason is, of the, uh, 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 is equivalent. As activities, these particular practices of thinking do not have the same consequences or the same use of unknowns for achieving their logical reasoning, truth, or axioms. This means that logic is entrenched with particular possibilities of working out what is known and what can be known, whereby particular incomputabilities, particular modes of randomness are used not just as a limit to a system or a limit to logic, but as an experimental eventuation of new premises and new results. From this standpoint, information is not simply the instrument of cybernetic metaphysics, but is now used by learning intelligence as means, instrumentalities for machine knowledge. Far from defining a purposeless uh, drive of function after function, this pragmatist view of instrumentality accounts for an experimental use of unknowns as involving an elaboration of ends in terms of instrumental logic. But to argue for a philosophy of machines, because in, a, in effect that is what is, is I'm trying to argue here, um, whether we can uh, not just say that automation, like Heidegger said, is the end of philosophy, but actually with cybernetic, what we have is a kind of transformation of reasoning through a by machine, through a by instrument. And this is, for me, also a kind of uh, political twist that I want to give to the critique of the 1980s critique of, uh, of cybernetics, especially started with the work of uh, uh, Donna Haraway, for which the cyborg was a figuration of uh, a new mode of subjectivity whereby 
um, the natural uh, idea of or the naturalized idea of gender, race and class could be challenged through the instrument, through information and communication technology. And for me, this is just a, an elongation of the, or an expansion of that project uh, by also trying to refigure or figure out what kind of instead, what kind of beast we are dealing with. Because obviously, when we talk about, when, she, when, when uh, Donna Hara was talking about uh, automated information uh, system, information system of the, of the 80s, they were very different from the kind of uh, post uh, 90s. Uh, uh, technologies of communication that we have today that uh, operate exactly by and through randomness, so by through indeterminacy, and um, includes the four modes of knowing that are uh, of, a, of a different kind, that are much more complex and much more able to elaborate their own thinking, uh, and not just uh, something that can be reduced to a function. So, but to argue for a philosophy of machine is mainly, for me, a speculative effort uh, that requires an attentive discrimination amongst practices of reasoning, concerning not only how they work, but also how they conceptually can use randomness and generate new possibilities of meanings. What kind of meaning, what kind of knowledge, what kind of reasoning are machines producing? This is also an effort towards the invention of methods where practical reasoning becomes central to work out um, uh, and also, uh, to work throughout, sorry, and with general models that must revisit the separation between the philosophical project of the arts and the humanities and the cybernetic or techno-scientific project of instrumentality. Generality, so my argument is for a general mode of knowledge that includes these, these, these efforts that, rather than separating them. But, um, but also what it, what it requires is a, a, a dialogical construction between premises and results. The invention of hypothesis to challenge uh, assumption and to reassess our material practices can be collectiv collectively endorsed through the discourse of imagination and the multiplication of reasoning. So the, the effort that I am actually uh, arguing for is, uh, um, is an effort to rethink uh, of technicity or instrumentality uh, as uh, a project that already started for, since the Second World War in terms of denaturalizing reasoning. Because obviously the problem of a naturalized, naturalized understanding of reasoning uh, will just assume that uh, um, there, are, there is a hierarchy within uh, uh, you know, human culture whereby humans have a faculty of thinking and reasoning as opposed to, um, and, and we know the hierarchies that were produced within uh, uh, you know, the industrial period, vis-a-vis uh, -vis, um, questions of race, questions of gender, and questions of class. This kind of extension of uh, um, uh, the project of kind of mapping the evolution of instrumental thinking through time from the 40s when the argument is uh, the reason had become mindless um, because it had been already been substituted by information uh, system and by tasks. Uh, as Heidegger had argued. And then moving on onto uh, the late 40s when both the Turing machine and cybernetics emerged as a mode of wanting to mechanize reasoning. But that mechanization of reasoning showed that in, a, uh, in reality, uh, reason itself uh, is, is constructed uh, as a limit, uh, I, is based on failure, that there is no possibility of, uh, gather, of, of, of having a system of reasoning that could be totalizing, that could, uh, could, could actually include all possible results within its premises. So this was already acknowledged by Turing uh, in, the, in, the fifth, in, the late, in the late, between the, 40, the late 30s and the 40s, and then activated in computational machine in the 50s. 
Um, my point is that what happens when this machine do not only instantiate reasoning, but start to think, because they become experim experimental um, a vehicle for learning. And when learning becomes not only a way of uh, repeating, reiterating something, but actually uh, um, something that is already programmed in the system, but actually being able to use data to learn something else, to variate in learning, then you have another form of artificial intelligence. You no longer have AL, but you have ex machina, for instance. In terms of cultural tropes, so you have a, a kind of uh, um, a machine that can, can communicate with other machine, that can develop uh, cognition, affection, uh, and also um, can, uh, and it can also can develop a different mode of uh, asks us or demands of us to rethink and to open up the idea of what does logic. Can we still think that reasoning has to do with this kind of faculty that uh, linearly can deduce um, results from premises? How can how do we uh, uh, engage? with this uh, um, age of the algorithm where the infrastructure of communication runs behind or beyond or underneath our very cognition and perception or whether our cognition and perception is informed by algorithms. Uh, so the point is how can this be used both to challenge Western metaphysics but also uh, and the project of rationalization but also to rethink um, reasoning, to rethink subjectivity, to rethink logic with this instrument, rather than just, uh, uh, rather than just um, thinking that exactly that, you know, that the whole system is based on some kind of accident. Uh, and we don't know how the system works. The question is exactly, can we start mapping or unpacking and reinventing and, and uh, inventing or philo fictionalizing in terms of how can how is this this infrastructure work and re-inhabiting um, a future program you know if these machines if the infrastructure the logical infrastructure of, of cybernetic computation machine today program the future uh, preempt the future because this is the argument you know whichever uh, statistical uh, calculation you can have uh, on, on how long you're going to live, how many accidents you can have in life, or you know, whether you are more likely to do this or that. All that kind of figuration of your behavior uh, can, can and must be rethought, taken back. You know, the future doesn't just belong to the branding or the statistical calculation of uh, of governance or your health insurance. So how do, um, the question is how do we collectively develop uh, practices uh, whereby um, the, 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 the machine logic can be unpacked to be re-articulated um, in a different way. So um, if onto power and accidental sovereignty are models that have exhausted the possibility of political thinking, because that's what I think they have. They, they exhausted the possibility of political thinking with machines because they are arguing that these are system of governance of which we don't know the, the way they operate, or, or which they operate in such an, in a stable, uh, fragmented way that uh, we cannot um, decode them, okay? But the question is, no, they, my question is, no, possibly they can be decoded because the, the problem of, uh, 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 of, um, of machine thinking is not that they are mysterious, it's that we don't allow for an understanding of how they operate. We, don't, we just relate that understanding to, to a scientific problem. But it's not just a scientific problem, it's a humanities problem, it's an art problem, it's a political problem. It's not just science and economics problem. So how do we do that? How do we re-unpack that kind of relation between 
uh, reasoning, uh, prediction, patterning, randomness, uh, contingencies unknown. And, 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 and these are models, you know, we can, there are models there that we can, we can, we can use. So um, the question is how to rethink uh, philosophy through instrumentality. Um, which can possibly be a good starting point also for a political re-envisioning of cybernetics rather than a condemnation of cybernetics. Thank you. <laughs> automated surgery or automated vehicle results in the loss of life, who should be to blame? Is That's a very important question. Insurance Causality. companies or... Yeah, yeah. There is a there is a lot of argument about that because obviously, the the surgeon, uh, you know, may say that, um, or the insurance company may say is the robot. Eh? It has to be played. There's a fault in the robot, but this is the same as when a drone is shot in a in in zone area. You know, and and, and instead of shooting a target, shoots civilians. Yeah, who is responsible? Uh, mo most people are try trying to talk about the legalization of co-causality. So it's a co-causality, co so not just one, not one, one responsible, many responsible. So there is, so the, you unpack all of, the, all of it. Obviously, it has to do with the, the surgeon, it has to do with the, the, the clinic, it has to do with the, who made the machine. Um, you know, uh, but also, you know, the question is whether the machine can do something that was not programmed for. And this is very a massive problem uh, because machine learning does uh, allow for decision making. And you have seen, we see this with very simple examples with, um, I mean, simple, apparent examples with the high frequency trading, where there is, there is, this, there is a discussion as to, um, you know, the decision to invest into uh, some kind of um, a product must be taken so fast at the nano, 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 nano seconds that the machine can do much, you know, that there is no time to supervise it. Huh? And so the decision is taken and something com can go completely wrong or can, be, can go completely well. <laughs> you know, so it's a very, it's a very, um, it's a juridical question, and I think must be addressed as a juridical question. And I, I, I'm sure that there are court cases on this, uh, pretty much, yeah. But yeah, it's a very important question. From your argument, can we infer that either now or in the near future, create, that man will no longer be the primary creative force, and that like truck drivers, artists, poets, composers, and writers, may become absolutely superfluous? Yeah, that's, uh, that's the question that is called existential risk. There's a group in Oxford that is working on this, about existential risk. There is other, also other philosophers like John Serry who says absolutely no, that's absolutely impossible because, you know, the, you know, the famous idea of um, uh, the Chinese room, you know, you can give uh, you can give uh, the, the computer all the data, but Chinese doesn't mean they understand the meaning of, because it, you know, of, of, of communication when it communicates. It can just put all stuff together, but doesn't understand the meaning, doesn't, doesn't have the sensibility, the refinement of experience. Yeah? That's, uh, but uh, this is another content, a very, you know, I guess it's a very old question, because one could look back at the automata of the 17th century, and you have this kind of um, uh, Turkish chess player. I don't know if I have an image, I do have an image. One, a Turkish chess player, and the discussion at the time was, uh, who, who, is, who, is, who is moving, is, is, is it the machine? Is it, so, and, and it was an example of uh, the highest faculty of reason that could be embodied by a machine. But something changed in the 1900s that basically, um, uh, in this kind of automated intelligence instead it became just a sign to clerical work. That's why I got, I got all this picture of women working in the, during the Second World War, uh, you know, encoding women computers, they're called, you know, especially um, black and white women working together, especially in a long history, I think 
in a kind of very popular uh, co uh, uh, reference hidden figures. Eh? The movie in the figures, as we are all talking. So there is this kind of, uh, but, they, but they, 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 they marketed according to some historians of cybernetics, they marketed a transformation of, uh, you know, automation as high level of intelligence to automation as clerical work, clerical scientific work. But then you see that the clerical scientific work, and then they say becomes a very, uh, you know, a, a work of encryption, decryption of massive, uh, uh, um, massive level of complication, uh, a calculation, a mathematical, so there is a mathematical, not genius, but there is a mathematical, rational uh, process going on there that is not just clerical, it's not just task, that's what I mean. Uh, but then uh, you have had a lot of experiments in the 60s, in the 70s with automated art, automated sound, uh, vanguardist uh, project of conceptual art, vanguardist project. So the question is not about just replacement, but the question is try to understand what kind of autonomy these learning machines are acquiring and how they are developing a machine aesthetic or a machine sensibility. It's not about replacing, but I guess if we don't ask the question, it will be just a way of replacing, a bit like uh, automation is going to hit the job market in less than 20 years uh, on a massive scale, globally. Of course, this will create a different kind of, you know, of, of segregation and, and this equality amongst cor uh, workers. The idea is to try to get a universal income so that labor, uh, you know, work it doesn't exist anymore. So there are, there are obviously the, this, there are a lot of difficulties, but I don't think it's just a matter of replacing. It's a matter of actually enlarging <clears throat> the idea of, of aesthetic sensibility and uh, reasoning to other forms. And it's not just machine. For me, the machine is just an example, which is my example because I, I'm interested <laughs> in it, but it's also an example of understanding other cultures, mm -hmm. other modes of reasoning, other modes of sensibility that were, are not supposed to be the dominant, you know, they're not supposed to have a sensibility. So it's about really also looking at the world, and that's why it's important, again, when I go back to the 80s and the kind of science fiction writing of the 80s, uh, black family science fiction, rather, the 80s, where they were describing modes of knowledge that were developed and sensibility and aesthetics developed already in the, uh, in the, in, in the, in America, uh, in the, in the 80s, where you still had that segregated culture. So uh, she was writing about a post-nuclear world, uh, but uh, this is Octavia Butler, by the way. But, um, but she was describing, she was describing, you know, every day, every day. And it's, so it's about also to, um, for me, uh, the idea of instrumentality, re recuperating instrumentality is to recuperate the idea that the mean, the mean to knowledge of, is not just a mean. It's not something that you can just use the, to achieve, or, you know, like, like the idea of the colonial empire capital or patriarchy that you can use an instrument to achieve something, but the instrument develops its own sensibility, its own logic, its own culture. So, you see, on one end is the machine, but for me it's bigger than the machine in terms of its political implication. The alliance between animal, human, machine, gender, race that was started in the 1980s with Donna Haraway, I think, is, is within the circle of critical theory of technology, <laughs> if I may. But even bigger in terms of also art expression and uh, architectural expression is, is quite important to, to claim. A question? Two questions in the back. Good evening and thank you for uh, your, your presentation this evening. It's phenomenal. Um, not to go off on a tangent or to have a political conversation, but the crux of your argument is looking at this modem as, from a different perspective. The one question I have for you is the word control you use quite a few times. And if we go back all the way through history, um, control is not something that is very 
very willingly relinquished. So why? Why then would the existing mechanism allow for it to be questioned to be utilized in a different format? Yes, control. It's interesting because you know, uh, control, um, you can understand control in terms of domination or in terms of um, self-regulatory system. So um, in terms of domination, I totally you know, agree that there obviously, you know, uh, uh, um, first of all, it's a struggle and a fight. You know, there's no way they're gonna, no one is gonna give you nothing for <laughs> absolutely. You know, actually, you know, it's interesting. I've just been thinking about this one percent question and why we have Brexit and Trump. And I'm sorry <laughs> if I offend anyone because you have to be politically correct. It's important, but you know, if uh, apparently. But you know, the, the, is this because the domination has basically that kind of domain, that kind of maintaining the resource in such a small megalomaniac way for years, uh, that is neoliberal capital, has, has uh, you know created a, a social disgregation, you know, a social disgregation to the level that you know people thought that actually at this point, at least I'm talking, I, I'm, I live in in, in London. Of course, you know, Brexit is the solution. London didn't vote for Brexit, but, you know, is the solution. The solution is completely something that has no meaning whatsoever or has the meaning of uh, 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 actually go back to a conservative nationalist bread and butter idea, but completely dominated by social networks, completely dominated so, and, and by uh, you know, uh, algorithmic intelligence yeah, and statistical modes of counting on who is going to vote. You know, this is really so. It's super domination. So that kind of, I, I don't, I don't, uh, um, uh, I don't disagree at all. I think that uh, computational uh, uh, planetary sovereignty exists absolutely. The, the question is, I do not want to relinquish, uh, and I don't want to abandon. The, the field of machine thinking to domination. I want to rethink of it in terms of its kind of uh, uh, perspective of, of, of uh, moving away from an understanding of power in terms of domination because cybernetics, the idea of cybernetics uh, control is, is really based on feedback. It's dialogic, it has to do with uh, self-regulation that always has to include the dialogue between the input and the output, and can transform in time. So I want to recuperate this also this idea that um, control can also, or modes of prediction can also be turned towards a constructive uh, alliance, and not just the kind of politics of domination. So I agree with you, but it's a political, and a th perhaps one could argue theoretical, speculative challenge that I'm just writing science fiction here, but I'd rather write science fiction than not write at all, you know. So I don't want to relink. I want my 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 challenge is to take away technology from its uh, identification with capital and governance. I want to take it away from that. I want to recuperate because there are examples in history that has been recuperated, both at a conceptual level, a practical level, artistic level. Like, you know, there is, there, is, there is a way that one can recuperate technicity. And when I talk about technology, that is something I'm working on, on technological consciousness, I'm saying that there is a consciousness that doesn't belong to the human or the machine, but there is a consciousness that is, is including uh, the way the machine see the world now. There is something, so, so during modernity, you have all this kind of, uh, literature, art, and uh, cinema where, you know, technology is your unconscious, you know, that shows that, you know, that actually something that we don't want to see because we, through technology we have destroyed, you know, during the Second World War, of course, extermination, colonization, uh, you know, all sorts of violence. It's something that is, something that has to be repressed. But all the history, all those stories have come out. We have had feminists, we have, you know, we have had many modes of uh, uh, articulation of, uh, uh, um, of a class, re gender, race, 
in terms of political thinking and political action. So um, that as we can't just make it unconscious again. That is part of conscious. We've not got to claim it back. <laughs> Something in history has happened. So those period of the 80s in terms of uh, um, claiming for uh, other logics, other modes of living, um, that for me the instrument instantiates needs to be claimed back as something that is part of consciousness, not, not unconscious, is here, it's happened. So let's stop pretending that it's not, it's not real, as it were. Okay, I have another question. As the metaphysics of cybernetics starts to disseminate in other areas outside of economics and technology, and we re reconfigure the way we think about things um, in society, is there a role for cybermenetics to commentate on religion? And what's the interaction with religion? What does it have to say about religion? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a very, um, there is actually, um, cybernetics already was talking about religion in terms of um, um, the kind of, you know, it depends obviously what you mean by religion, because obviously there is, uh, there is a kind of question of numerology and, and religion in terms of whether you understand religion, how do you understand religion? The belief in something Beyond. that excludes error. That excludes error. And can't be learned, and there's no way <coughs> because it's all knowing that belief. No, the belief that, no, because Sabinet is exactly the, the opposite, it's based on learning. So, you know, there is no, there is no law, no, exactly. It's exactly that. It's exactly declares the crisis of the law. <laughs> uh, so that you can't just start from some kind of pure axiom, huh? some kind of pure law that uh, is descended on us, transmitted on us, or the opposite. Cybernetics, exactly, by the, uh, that's what also Adek was pointing out, by, by, by bringing the end of metaphysics, <laughs> Uh, it means that uh, you can no longer rely on truth, but the truth is relative to the environment and the relation and the history in which you are involved. That doesn't, doesn't mean that there is no truth. It means that the truth emerges from practice, from doing, from learning, from engaging, from struggle. It doesn't, doesn't emerge, it's not given. But doesn't mean, uh, the, the fact, but the, the question is, when you argue that there is no truth and no law, most critical thinking then has ended up saying um, that everything is either locally relative or that is impossible to, or, the, or the, relative to your opinion or to your idea or to your background or to your community. And that has destroyed culture, you know, even, you know, for instance, Richard Rorty in terms of localization of culture. And that has precluded the possibility of a common project, of a common project where, you know, there is a possibility of arguing for a truth at some point, of a logic or an axiom, but should not come from something that is not, first of all, practiced. Yeah? It's there is a lot of existentialism in this. It's existential, but then it does, it, it jumps after existentialism, it needs to jump into the construction of a law. It doesn't just stay in existence, but yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. good point. Any other question? Do you think the new uh, cognitive intelligence systems are artificial, or do you think that they're natural? Because we teach them based on example, they can adapt, they can improvise, no, so I why? I would always argue that they are artificial because uh, naturalization is an enemy for me because to go back to, na to nature, they assume that everything, you know, I guess we need a philosophy of nature that accounts for this process of artificialization. But I think even if it's adaptable from the very beginning, you know, cybernetic computation were interested in adaptive system, you know, or system that will tell you, Oh, you know, like uh, your Amazon system on your, they will tell you, oh, you like this, I'm sure you like that as well. You know, they kind of preempt what you can learn next, what you can go next. So Google that writes back to you, 
in case you've been searching for cars, oh, maybe you'd be interested in this car. And what about this other mode? This kind of variation, association, in preempting what your desire will be. So preempting your future, that's what I mean by preempting the future. Uh, and uh, that's not natural. You know, that is, is a kind of, uh, is a kind of mode of uh, um, imposing, imparting a probability of your behavior. It's in imparting a conduct. You are pres being prescribed in behaving in a certain way rather than another. So, no, uh, uh, I guess naturalization no, is, 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 I think they are always artificial in this sense, in the sense that there is, there is some kind of relation between uh, a, a mean and an end. They are do there is a reason why this is happening, yeah? So it's not natural in that way. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I know. Eisenberg. Eisenberg, I know. And then someone's going to say this. We're not going to quite get it. I want you to say No, I know uh, you're right. But, you know, the thing is that uh, yeah. the, the question today is getting either way. You either know we have different times with this question. Sure. Sure. Just